Hi everyone. There's a lot to cover in today's video, but most pressing is the fact that Earth's magnetosphere, Earth's protective shield, has been undergoing rapid changes over the past few days because of this guy, the sun. The sun has been emitting a bunch of solar flares that have been impacting Earth's magnetic field, and this creates what are known as geomagnetic pulsations. Now, uh, most people think of solar flares impacting the Earth as space weather, and this can create a geomagnetic storm. And one of the characteristics of a geomagnetic storm are these pulsations. So you can see these magnetic field lines changing, moving, and altering with this increased energy flux from the sun or just from the interstellar environment. And you can see that this energy then gets uh, brought into the Earth from the outside interplanetary system and then bring is brought more directly and more um, close into the Earth's geophysical systems. This is often seen as like aurora. So in the north and the south, uh, aurora will pop up when there's a lot of energy injection from the sun to the Earth. And then if it's a very strong storm, these northern and southern lights will actually go further south for the northern hemisphere and further north for the southern hemisphere. But there's more to this story than just that. There's been a lot of geomagnetic pulsations and the overall Earth's magnetic field is weakening in certain areas. This is the South Atlantic anomaly, as we can see here. This is a quote unquote dent in the magnetic field where the radiation belts that surround our planet are brought really close into the Earth's surface, only 200 kilometers or so above the Earth's surface. Uh, which is well within our atmosphere. Normally they are uh, quite a ways out at about one to two Earth radii minimum. And this has an effect of dramatically weakening Earth's magnetic field in this zone over uh, South America and the Atlantic Ocean. So you can see here in nanotesla, the magnetic field reading 2200 or 22,000, sorry. And then we go all the way up to about 20, uh, we go all the way up to about 80,000 in certain spots. Um, and so this, this South Atlantic anomaly, this patch of weakened magnetic field has been growing over the past few years. And this is all connected to the recent geomagnetic pulsations that we've been seeing. Here are our radiation belts. Those are the structures that go in and create that anomaly. And you can see recently we've had a big dumping of radiation uh, from the ions from the radiation belt into the Earth, we can see that happen right about here. Uh, we get a big pressure and a squeeze, and then all those ions go and move into the Earth. Now, what's interesting about this is that we've actually been altering the radiation belt since the creation of electricity and the widespread distribution of power grids, because those create ion cyclotron frequencies at 50 and 60 hertz and some other minor frequencies near there that actually pull ions out of the radiation belts and cause them to precipitate earthwards. So we have been altering these radiation belts ourselves artificially with our power systems. Um, and then they're also influenced by things like the Schumann resonances, which are also in that same frequency band. So we are altering the magnetic field in ways that we really don't understand. And at the same time, we're being hit by a lot of solar flares, space weather, etc. So uh, just hi everyone, if you're new to the channel, welcome. Uh, my name is Stefan, I uh, am a geophysicist who's kind of moved into the YouTube realm. Here's a photo of me with a magnetometer out in Utah. Um, and so I've done direct work with collecting magnetic field data and things of that nature. And then I've now applied that towards uh, an understanding of the larger geophysical systems at play and also looking at things like space weather and more. So we've had a bunch of solar flares recently. We can look at our data from July 27th here. You can see that going all the way up to uh, August 3rd, which is when I'm filming this. And you see this a bunch of, of some actually pretty strong flares at times and some interesting plasma flows within the sun, but a lot of just really kind of like rapid and uh, you can say like poppy activities, just kind of like pop, 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 pop. And what you'll see is we've had a big sunspot region here starting to rotate into Earth view. So this is the 31st of July. Now it's August 1st, just August 1st, just a couple days ago. And we see a whole bunch of sunspots coming in. 
Now, these sunspots are located on the sun dependent on, there's a big flare, dependent on where we are in the solar cycle. There's another right there. So we've been receiving a lot of input from the sun because it's been increasing towards solar maximum. And as a result, these uh, sunspot bands are getting closer and closer to the equator. When they do, it's called a termination event. And then that it signals kind of the, um, the, the beginning of the next solar cycle. So that was a very large flare there. That created actually a radiation storm. You can see that build up right there. Boom. Uh, that created a, ra a radiation storm. We've actually had a few radiation storms recently, and that's been charging these radiation belts with more energy than normal. Um, and so that has provided a lot of fuel to create these large magnetic field changes. And so the question that a lot of people are asking is, is Earth's magnetic field weakening? Is there something that we need to be worried about? Is our protective shield not as protective as it used to be? Now, uh, this South Atlantic anomaly that exists, that is definite indication that parts of Earth's magnetic field is weakening, but the, the overall story is a little bit more complex. As you see here, we have a, a representation of the Earth. Here is the core, both the outer and then the inner. That's what we believe uh, to exist down there. Um, and this is the best model that we found so far to explain why the Earth has a magnetic field is that there is a outer core which generates a dynamo. So there's swirling currents of these highly, highly uh, uh, energetic iron and nickel alloys and things of that nature. Um, and basically there's plasma in the center of the Earth. There potentially is even uh, nuclear fusion happening there, which is what has sustained our magnetic field for as long as it has, whereas other planets like uh, Mars and our moon, their magnetic fields died out, um, maybe because they didn't have just simply enough mass to continue. Uh, but these uh, magnetic fields generated by the core of our planet are very, very powerful, and then they attenuate through the mantle, this very hot, highly pressurized, viscous rock, viscous on a geologic time scale. Um, it gets attenuated through the mantle many orders of magnitude, at least two, or like two orders of magnitude, if not more. We're really not certain. So while the magnetic field strength at the surface of the Earth may be, let's say, 50,000 nanotesla or 0.5 gauss, at the core of the Earth, it is much, much stronger. But what happens is any magnetic interactions here, out in space, the radiation belts, or let's say uh, a little bit closer to the surface, like the ionosphere, whatever, they can influence and pierce through the mantle and go to the core or vice versa, the core can have its fluctuations that then go out depending on their frequency and power. So the lower frequency a pulsation, the lower frequency these lines are kind of moving back and forth, the more likely they are to go to the core and to affect change within the core of our planet. And that is the ultimate key in regards to understanding what's happening to our magnetosphere. Because when we have a magnetic pole flip, last one was about 70, 700,000 years ago, the North Pole switches to the South Pole, South Pole switches North. That happens on the Sun every 11 years. On the Earth, it's much more random, sporadic, and not nearly as frequent. Um, but the magnetism of the planet goes down dramatically, exposing the planet to greater space weather uh, events and geomagnetic storms and radiation from the Sun and uh, the rest of the cosmos. And that is not good for life or your DNA or for any uh, molecule because it basically gets ionized, broken up much easier. These particles are raining down and breaking chemical bonds. So um, there is, uh, we do think that the inner core is solid. It has a permanent magnetic field. So maybe there's a slight permanent magnetic field that protects our planet when the outer core kind of comes to a halt. We don't really know, but we are seeing really big pulsations right now, um, uh, like within the Earth. Uh, we can see this specifically with the Schumann resonances, which convert high frequency energy into low frequency energy. So these are energy fields that exist from zero to 40 plus hertz. They are standing waves of light, uh, photons, electromagnetism. I'll go into the definition a little bit more, but just if we quickly look here, zero to eight hertz, that's that low frequency band. We see a whole bunch of activity recently in that sub five hertz band, a lot of geomagnetic pulsations. I've been watching this for a while. 
We don't normally see this many. Even just uh, today, we saw a very interesting like wave of pulsations come through, starting at a lower frequency, going a little bit higher, and then culminating with the big burst in this sub eight hertz zone. So we're gonna talk about the Schumann resonances and these uh, altering uh, frequencies. We're also gonna look at some current data. Like for example, we have the College Park data out of Maryland from the USGS and then also the Sitka Alaska data. And we see just the, the standard magnetic field. This is Earth's magnetic field uh, at that location. The total field strength, 56,648 nanotesla. Uh, that is the peak right there. Uh, and then the low is 56,149. So we had a nearly 500, almost exactly 500 nanotesla difference within the span of just a few hours out of College Park. You can see that here. If we go more towards the average kind of where it was before, 56,300 all the way up to 6, uh, 56,650. So like a 350 nanotesla jump at College Park, that's a geomagnetic field pulsation. You can see this wave is uh, quite a few hours in duration. And then in Alaska, you can actually see it was the opposite. It was a dip in uh, the magnetic field strength. And so we go here, we see it was about 55,000 nanotesla and the low went all the way down to 54,661. So that is a about 350 nanotesla dip there. So very significant, very strong. Um, magnetic pulsations that have been coming into our Earth recently. Um, we can look at our recent KP indices, also our HP30 for 30 minute and 60 minute data. And this is basically measured geomagnetic volatility. I also have this in the Schumann slide, so we'll look at that too. But what we see is that we had this geomagnetic storm on the 26th. Uh, there was some volatility in Earth's geomagnetic field. We just recently had some on the 2nd. There, with a mini geomagnetic storm that we had reaching a KP of 4.33, we see it a little better here with the, um, the HP60, the hourly index, a little bit higher resolution. But there's been quite a bit of activity on our sun, uh, on our Earth, and also from our sun, if we look at X-ray data that's collected uh, by the GOES, uh, geostationary satellites that are positioned within Earth's radiation belts, they measure X-ray flux. These are wavelengths of light that uh, are coming in from all directions. We'll see X-ray flux spike from things like a uh, gamma ray burst, let's say, more so gamma rays. But the, the sun releases a lot of X-ray radiation. Uh, and so the GOES satellite picks that up. And X-ray radiation, this very, very high frequency wavelength of light, ionizes the atmosphere very, very well. So. Um, when there's a big solar flare or coronal mass ejection or filament launch, there's a whole bunch of things that can happen on the sun. When those things happen, a lot of photons typically stream out from the sun. A lot of these photons are at X-ray wavelengths. Some of them are in the visible light spectrum. For example, we can go back here and we can actually see some of these flashes of light, right? Um, so, well, this is also colorized here too, to a certain angstrom of light. But there, there'll be an actual flash of light with a solar flare. So the sun is releasing a bunch of photons across the entire electromagnetic spectrum with a solar flare. Some of these are x-rays, and these are a good measure of the strength of a solar flare. So you can see just how varied and volatile the sun's been recently. A lot of spikes, some of them reaching the M-class zone, a lot in the, the C-class. And then like, for example, here, we had a very long, big period, one, two, three, four, five, just going one after another uh, of solar flare activity, and that created a very large, you can see, zone of higher X-ray flux. So these um, X-rays and extreme ultraviolet wavelengths have been interacting with our radiation belts, interacting with our uh, ionosphere, creating electric currents, and in general, there's been uh, magnetosphere uh, waves that have been happening, there's been uh, increased electric currents in the ionosphere, there's been a lot of uh, Schumann resonances, uh, as we've been seeing here, uh, in the lower sub-5 hertz band. And all these are geomagnetic field pulsations. We also saw that very large one as collected by the USGS. Now, what is a geomagnetic field pulsation? Why is this relevant to the Earth's uh, magnetosphere and whether we're still protected? Well, the phenomenon of ultra-low frequency geomagnetic pulsations was actually first observed during 
1859 Carrington event, which is that huge solar flare that impacted the Earth and uh, knocked out uh, some of the early telegraph stations. Some of them actually like caught fire. It was so powerful. Um, here's the paper, by the way, Report of Geomagnetic Pulsation Indices for Space Weather Applications. Um, and so the first, the first geomagnetic pulsations were measured back then. Their equipment was lower quality and just didn't have as good of a uh, ability to record these things in detail. And so that was an event that was strong enough to actually uh, be observed by the lesser quality equipment that they had back then. So those are very strong ge geomagnetic pulsations that were observed. And pulsation frequency is considered to be ultra low when lower than the natural frequencies of plasma. Now plasma, superheated ions, the fourth state of matter, they have their own resonant frequencies that actually overlap, like I said earlier, with the power grid, 50, 60 hertz in that zone, and also with the Schumann resonances in the, um, in the zone from zero to 40 hertz. So these are all ion cyclotron resonant plasma frequencies as well, and these Schumann resonances travel beyond the ionosphere out into the radiation belts and actually cause ion precipitation to happen because these ions, this plasma, will start to vibrate with uh, these frequencies and then they precipitate down to our Earth, interact with the ionosphere and even the lower frequency too. Um, so the, um, where was I again? Uh, the, uh, the power grids and the Schumann resonances have been interacting uh, with the radiation belts a lot. We've been seeing a big uh, uh, constant pulsations of uh, ions from the radiation belts into the Earth system. And we've been playing with this for a while. Um, and so these pulsations are ultra low when they are at frequencies even lower than these plasma frequencies. So you have uh, energy that can then uh, go into resonance with plasma, these, these super energetic ions. And then the ultra low pulsations are the ones that potentially have the, uh, can go and actually pierce through the mantle, or at least deep into the crust, pierce through the mantle and potentially even reach the core. It really depends on their, uh, the frequency. The lower the frequency, the better the ability they have to go all the way through the body of the earth to the core or vice versa. So higher frequency pulsations are caused by fluctuations and instabilities in the equatorial ionosphere and magnetosphere. Lower frequency pulsations are caused by other complicated phenomena such as local wave particle instability or from coupling of wave energy propagation uh, propagating through the magnetosphere. Um, they're produced either in the solar wind magnetosheath or at the magnetopause boundary layer. There's also pulsations that are created at the core. Some of them are very long in their time periods. We're just starting to tease some of them apart because we've now been measuring this stuff long enough to see some of these longer frequency trends. So there are geomagnetic pulsations that occur at every single frequency going all the way from, you know, the actual flip of the magnetic field. Uh, which is a very like you know 700,000 year million year frequency to geomagnetic excursions where the magnetic fields move quite a lot, uh, the pole locations move quite a lot, but they don't actually fully flip and then stabilize to things like um, variations of magnetic field strength at the core mantle boundary. We'll look at that in a little bit, but I'm showing you this because I want to show you the classification of these pulsations. The ones that we're interested in right now. Uh, for the most part, the ones that we have good data for that I can show you are these PC1 pulsations that exist from 0.2 to 5 hertz. So uh, there's lower frequency ones, as you can see here. They get quite low frequency. You can really start to understand them better with how their, their time scale. This is 0.2 seconds to 5 seconds. So 0.2 hertz is uh, 5 seconds. Um, and then 0.2 seconds is 5 hertz. And then we, all, we go all the way here, it's like 600 seconds. So that's a fairly low frequency, long duration pulsation. And we do see those, um, but it requires very specialized equipment to measure because these are very, very low frequency. So we do see that with our data here, that's a very low frequency geomagnetic pulsation and a very strong one. Some of these can be very, very strong, 300 nanotesla, very powerful. Whereas these pulsations that we're looking at, the Schumann resonances, these are picotesla strength. So they are uh, a couple orders of magnitude less than nanotesla. So to get back more into the Schumann resonances, because this is where a lot of our pulsation data is that's showing what's happening with our magnetosphere and will give us a better understanding of whether we're kind of protected from space weather um, now and in the future. 
uh, we, we can look at these Schumann resonances in the KP indices. But the Schumann resonances, if you don't know, are extremely low frequency standing waves of light. This can be thought of as electromagnetic waves, electromagnetic fields, photons, they're all uh, just ways to kind of understand light, light energy, uh, radio waves, microwaves, infrared radiation, visible light, uh, ultraviolet light, x-rays, gamma rays, and beyond. Uh, and these Schumann resonances are observed in the extremely low frequency band. And they're standing waves, so they're stable frequencies of light. You can see how they are propagating smoothly over time. This is our time axis, the x-axis. And so uh, they are observed at 7.8 hertz. You see this first one there, 7.8 hertz. 14, 20, 25, 33, and beyond. They vary in power and frequency by about plus or minus one hertz. Uh, the power can vary quite a bit depending on the energy flow into and within Earth's geophysical system. So here's just a little graphic showing the Schumann resonances. Here's our Earth. These are these extremely low frequency waves of light. Uh, these fields, you can really think of them better as electromagnetic fields that constantly always have a higher energy than the background radiation near them. Let's say like 7.8 hertz, the foundational mode, has more energy than 9 hertz um, consistently. Here's the ionosphere. They exist between the Earth's surface and the ionosphere very strongly, but you can also measure them in the Earth's surface. They're one of the dominant electromagnetic frequencies that you can find in the Earth's crust. And then they also bleed through the ionosphere out into space into the radiation belts. Um, and so you can actually, with this graphic I made here, uh, here's the radiation belts. This is a zone of plasma that surrounds our planet. Uh, there's uh, a radiation belt that contains electrons, there's a radiation belt that contains protons. Um, you can see the other one here. And so these Schumann frequencies actually go out and they're at the same ion cyclotron resonant frequencies as different ions, depending on the Earth's magnetic field strength, and that can cause these uh, ions to then rain down into the ionosphere and bring energy into the overall system. And again, uh, a lot of this then turns into like, let's say, atmospheric activity, thunderstorms, but some of this ultimately goes down and reaches to our core. So there's a very complicated system at play uh, with our magnetic field. And anyone that's telling you that they know exactly what's going to happen with the magnetic field uh, in the future, um, they're just not being honest with you because we really don't know so much about our magnetic field. But we can track what's happening in real time and just make a uh, best like best predictions as possible. And we can continue our education of this, collect more data constantly. Uh, what's interesting about the Schumann resonances is, is that in addition to being one of these gateways from uh, the more like the inner surface of the earth um, and these lower frequency geomagnetic pulsations and then space weather is that they also interact with us biologically. We evolved in these. So they have strong interactions with the brain, the heart and the nervous system cells ion channels, proteins, enzymes, uh, DNA, water, um, different uh, things in our body like collagen, which are piezoelectric in nature and can uh, respond to magnetic fields by producing electric currents. Um, so there's a bunch of known biologic interactions uh, that we have with the Schumann resonances. It, they seem to be uh, very, very important. I don't think we uh, know even probably 1% of actually how they interact with us biologically and then also bioelectrically and then also consciously. There's uh, some good evidence uh, that they interact with our consciousness and that perhaps these Schumann resonances are fields of consciousness that we all connect to. So I have a, I have a big video on that. I suggest you go give that a watch. Uh, I'll put a link in the video description. Um, but if we look back at our data here, and actually let's go to the, uh, the legend here so you can understand. This is low power uh, here, dark blue, going up to high power white. This basically means how much energy are, are at these frequencies. So this is the 7.8 foundational mode. How much energy is contained within that field, in that wave, that standing wave? Uh, well, you can see that it's not blue, it's green. So there's a good amount. And then at times it actually goes up here to more of the orange zone. And then even like for here, for example, it goes all the way up to white. So it's a very high power compared to normal. It varies over time, but the frequencies don't change that much. They just go up and down by about one hertz or so, depending on a, a variety of factors like space weather, like earthquakes, 
like what's happening in the ionosphere, like what happens when there is a thunderstorm that passes overhead. We've had some thunderstorms that passed over uh, this measurement station in Tomsk. And so you see that data like this, for example, was a thunderstorm, I believe. Um, there's, there's a few. I know for sure that this one right here on August 1st is from a thunderstorm uh, because you can actually look at the, um, the weather, past weather for Tomsk. And we have that right here. And we see on Tuesday, August 1st, we see thunderstorms from 1800 to 2400. This is a rough, you know, uh, uh, data uh, kind of collection that they've done. But for our purposes, it's sufficient because we look here and we see right in that zone that they're talking about, we see a big increase in the Schumann resonances. So this is from a thunderstorm. But some of these are from solar flares, like, for example, this one here. But then some of these are very odd and they're kind of, they're like happening consistently over and over. We have these uh, lower frequency Schumann resonances bursts that are going into that PC1 geomagnetic pulsation classification that's sub five hertz happening in the afternoon hours like we see here on the 24th, here on the 31st, you see how they look similar. There again on the 2nd, um, there on the 29th of July, 28th of July, 20th and 21st of July. So and there again on the 26th, they kind of changing their characteristics, but just a lot of very low frequency activity happening in this part of the light spectrum. And so uh, in general, while the uh, overall magnetic field hasn't been uh, rocking back and forth and super, super volatile, we can look at our KP index, which is a measure of geomagnetic field volatility derived from ground-based magnetometers. These are devices that measure the magnetic field. We see that it never really got, went beyond, or actually never really went to five. Um, it, all, it went to four a couple times, and in that four zone, for both uh, this period from July 18th to the 25th, and then also from July 26th now to, uh, this is showing to the second, but we saw what happened just recently earlier. Um, so the, the geomagnetic field hasn't been experiencing a tremendous volatility as measured by the KP indices, but we are seeing a lot of geomagnetic pulsations as measured by the Schumann resonances. And also, of course, uh, this big, big pulse measured at two different stations, uh, uh, separated by quite a distance, Alaska to Maryland, um, and very, very strong, you know, 300 nanoteslas up here and then also down there. It, that's important because that highlights the changes and differences between how these pulsations can manifest on the globe. In one location, you have a big increase in the magnetic field strength, and then in another location, you have a big dip. And you actually notice this dip right there is if, you know, you can see how it's lined up. This dip right there is that exactly uh, right when this then starts to shoot upwards to reach its maximum. So this is a very, very large magnetic wave that went through the earth and this is measured at the ground surface. So uh, this was measured here, this KP index, pick this up, right? We see this uh, volatility went up to 4.33. Um, and we should be expecting more of these. And that's why I wanna talk about, you know, earth's uh, magnetic field strength and what's happening because um, we are right now on our way towards solar maximum. So this is solar cycle 25. We've been measuring these for a while. We just got the numbers in, the sunspot numbers for July 2023. We saw sunspots were 159.1, and whereas June set a pretty big record of 163.4. If we zoom out, you can see that, that these new numbers here are higher than any sunspot numbers that we reached with solar cycle 24. So uh, now we have two months in a row where we've had higher values in solar cycle 24, and uh, we don't know how, whether this is gonna keep charging upwards or not. Maybe we're gonna to start to hit our plateau. Uh, I think we're gonna keep going. I think we're gonna see sunspots similar to let's say 21, 22, or 23, um, but that remains to be seen. Regardless, uh, big sunspots uh, uh, compared to solar cycle 24, now for solar cycle 25, and it, the peak is expected, like the solar maximum is expected to go from 2024 to the beginning of 2026. So we're only mid 2023 right now. So quite a lot of runway left ahead of us if those uh, estimates are correct in terms of the time. If we look at our 10.7 centimeter radio flux progression, uh, this is 
uh, a wavelength of light that has a 10.7 centimeter wavelength. So this is a radio wave that the sun emits very stably, but it changes in the total flux uh, based on where the sun is in its cycle. So here's solar cycle 24, very, very uh, weak, one of the weakest on record. And then we see here with solar cycle 25, uh, just very, very steep, fast growth. And we see we actually had a solar uh, radio flux peak in January with a value of 182, but now July is getting close to that again, and it was stronger than June. So while sunspots were less than uh, June, you know, July sunspots were less than June's, the radio flux was actually higher. So there's multiple ways of looking at this, but overall we're seeing a, a pretty rapid uptick in uh, energy coming from the sun to the earth. And if we look here, I mean, this is like 1960, 1940, we see these solar cycles used to be a lot stronger. 24 was very weak. Now, what we see here with 19, 20, 21 is that there was a strong solar cycle on each side of it. So 20 was weak, but then 19 was very strong. One of the strongest uh, that we've ever recorded. You see these sunspot values going up into the 300s. Wow. Uh, and then 21 was also quite quite strong compared to 20. So perhaps we'll see 25 be similar to 23. Uh, we really don't know. But regardless, uh, we have more uh, energy coming from the sun into the Earth system. Specifically, we see like order of magnitude increase in X-ray radiation. This is the radiation that uh, preferentially will ionize and break chemical bonds and charge up ions in the ionosphere. Uh, that induces uh, electric currents in the ground known as tellurics. It also changes weather patterns on Earth. We see big increases in extreme ultraviolet radiation during solar cycle, maximum as compared to minimum. Um, so there's a lot at play. And what, what happens too during, um, well, all the time with the sun is that it's emitting these streams of uh, plasma. So these are co-rotating interaction regions as they're known. There's always varying plasma density and velocity in the interplanetary environment. And what happens as we get closer to the solar maximum is that the interplanetary magnetic field environment becomes more unstable. During minimum, there's typically two co-rotating interaction regions, these, these bands here. But then during solar max, there can be many. So you see, we have a one, two, three, four right here with some little guys there. And then you see the velocity is quite variable too. Now I'm showing you this because uh, there may be an impact, uh, there may be a, a solar flare impact tomorrow uh, that's not shown on this model that was run on August 2nd, right at 00 uh, UTC. Um, but we do have a, a new co-rotating interaction region, a, a stream of higher plasma density arriving at Earth at the same time as that potential um, geomagnetic storm, that solar flare impact. And then also just looking a little bit ahead, we can see we have a very high plasma density uh, region um, coming up soon. So this will come in probably uh, around August, let's say like 11th or 12th or so. It remains to be seen, but we can see how it's moving there. So we have that uh, coming up after this, um, this, this stream that we're about to go through, or actually we're starting to go through right about now. So higher plasma density coming into the Earth environment just through the normal space weather uh, um, and solar wind environment, but then also lots of flare activity. Um, and we also have a very, very active sun, as you can see here. Look at our sunspots uh, as shown by their magnetic fields. We have one, two, three, four really big sunspots right there in the northern hemisphere, all uh, Earth direct. So any one of those could pop. This is a, a sunspot region that was very, very active. Uh, as it transits across, we have another one coming in from the southern hemisphere. So we have, you know, on the southern hemisphere, this big sunspot region, this one kind of holding these four in between them. So while these are potentially can pop off and flare individually or perhaps even together, like with a very large flare, or perhaps like these two work together, um, then as these rotate out, we're going to see this one rotate in and then also this sunspot region there rotate in. So we have constant solar activity happening right now and that is loading and putting a lot of pressure onto our magnetic field. We can look more specifically at some of that. 
Uh, but first, I want to just let you know that if you are feeling this, if you're really feeling these energies, uh, because there's a lot of energetic flux and there's, uh, you know, scientifically, a lot of data showing that this interacts with uh, us biologically. For example, during solar flares and geomagnetic storms, there's a higher rate of heart attacks and, um, and other heart-related issues. I have herbal teas that help with this. So the Tranquility Tea Blend is really, really great. It contains dandelion root as the first ingredient. That's a very high quality herb for things like gut health, for inflammation, for uh, you know relaxing, grounding yourself, chamomile flower, calendula, lemongrass, lavender. That one is great. I have a whole bunch of Tranquility in stock. This is like a trial run. I have a few electricities left. So if you want something that can pick you up with a little bit of caffeine, but still also improve your health and your wellness and reduce inflammation, electricity is the one to go to. Uh, and then vitality is really great for if you need some help with optimizing or balancing your hormones, reducing inflammation, improving your immunity. So just uh, a little mid video break here that there are things that you can do to handle and uh, work with these energies and herbal teas are one of the best ways you can do that. Uh, I would, I would, really encourage you to look into this Tranquility Tea Blend, all organic. I blended these myself. I use them myself. I love herbal teas. They help me a lot with my health and wellness practice and just to overall improve my life and my health and wellness. So I hope you find these useful. I made them and I blended these and I created this product to help uh, everyone that watches uh, my videos and subscribes to my channel uh, because I really have a big focus on improving people's health and wellness because that is so, so important. So. We can look specifically at Earth's magnetic field to understand these pulsations a little bit more. Here's a visualization. Here's the Earth. Here's the magnetic field. And what we'll see coming up is that um, this magnetic field is very, very strong. It exists everywhere. People will often say, okay, well, the magnetic field is only as strong as a, a bar magnet or like it's not even as strong as a fridge magnet. Well, it exists everywhere. And remember, this magnetic field had to go through the mantle. So a lot of it attenuates out, like 99 plus percent of the field strength is absorbed into the mantle. Um, so while at the surface, a fridge magnet locally will be stronger in that little, very small space of space time, let's say um, like half a square foot, right? Um, the magnetic field is everywhere. And so we can actually, you know, hear the field lines visualized. Uh, these field lines don't actually exist. These are just measurements of the field strength, but they exist at the surface. They exist up in the atmosphere. They exist in the ocean. They are really everywhere. Here's some sharks there for you. Um, and so these uh, magnetic field lines, and that's the subduction zone. Uh, we'll get maybe to that later. These magnetic field lines, this is a really good visualization there. They emanate again from the core and you see our mantle here, and here's our inner core, our outer core. There's a dipole. That's what we believe is happening based on our uh, observations and models that we've made. And you can see that there's actually um, a lot of convection happening. That's what creates this dipole. So these pulsations are able to reach this uh, part of our planet, these very low frequency pulsations. They then can influence the convective currents within our outer core. And that can then, uh, in a feedback loop, change the magnetic field uh, that gets expressed at the surface and in space. And then that changes how our sun interacts uh, with our Earth, or rather how our, you know, the Earth interacts with the space weather environment. So it's kind of a, a, a constant conversation between the sun and uh, the rest of the, let's say, galaxy, the universe, because sometimes there's very energetic events that happen that we pick up on. Um, and our planet. So we've been seeing a lot of uh, pulsations occurring, and I put this in here too because there's other things that can help with your, um, for balancing, by the way, some supplements that can help with uh, these pulsations and such. Uh, any of these electromagnetic disturbances, turkey tail, reishi mushroom, uh, magnesium, L-threonate, ashwagandha, chamomile, and passion flower. I'll put links to these in the video description as well. I uh, wanted to show you those in addition to my tea blends that I have because uh, these, like the Magmine is really, really good uh, for helping improve your sleep, relaxation, turkey tail, the same, reishi as well. These are all specifically herbs that help you to relax um, and engage in parasympathetic activity. And that's really important with these geomagnetic field pulsations. 
We'll see some of them here so you can get a better idea of what I'm talking about. Here's the magnetic field. And we'll actually talk about this video too. But look at, look at these lines here. I'm going to play this again. But look at these lines. You'll see how they're kind of undulating and moving. Those are geomagnetic field pulsations. So we have these across different time frequencies and they then go all the way down into the core of the planet. Um, so when you have a big space weather impact or event or a large disturbance in the magnetic field, that can potentially alter these uh, electromagnetic currents and flows within the core and such. So one of these geomagnetic pulsations that's been measured now by the swarm satellite from the ESA is uh, at the core mantle boundary. Um, it's very, very low frequency. That's why they can measure this there. And it has a wave period of seven years. So that's a very, very, very low frequency geomagnetic pulsation, geomagnetic wave. You can see the, uh, the changes in the magnetic field here, um, how they've gone uh, from like normal, you could say, down and then back and up and down. So there are these geomagnetic pulsations happening across many different time scales, uh, all the way from very rapid, high frequency, like happening within a second, these um, PC1 have uh, PC1 geomagnetic pulsations have a frequency that goes from 0.2 hertz to 5 hertz, right? So it can be five times a second. But some of them are uh, seven years in length. And of course, there's things like the magnetic flip and the excursion. But what we're seeing just right now, what I want to really, uh, you know, your take home message is that we're seeing just a lot of changes to Earth's magnetic field at this very moment in time. This summer has been quite dynamic for our planet. And as we approach solar maximum, I think we will have some surprises in store for us. So we'll see what that is. If you want to understand the, um, the interior of the Earth better, we can look at the hard rock evolution of the mantle. And then also we can look at uh, and kind of visualize the magnetohydrodynamics at play. So here we have the hard rock mantle, whether it's hot and tan or cold, kind of in these cooler colors. And you see how there's like... Um, the, the mantle will go up and down um, in various, uh, over time. This is 200 million years of evolution that they modeled here. So this is just, you know, they put some data into a model to see what they would get. Uh, but the mantle changes in its actual hard rock properties over time. And this influences the magnetohydrodynamics because hot mantle behaves differently electromagnetically than cold mantle. So here we, on the right, we see uh, some flows and magnetohydrodynamics, what that means is uh, the hydrodynamic properties of magnetic fields. So really how you can look at uh, magnetic fields and their flows similar to uh, water and how water is, you know, has these flows and these currents and these waves within it. So we see these waves uh, that, that they model within Earth's mantle of the magnetic field. And this is very interesting because this is really one of the big, big, big unknowns of our Earth is that we have a fairly good idea and understanding of the magnetic field as it exists at the core because we can uh, create models of dipoles and they match up very, very well with the Earth's dipole. So that's a, and it's a fairly simple model. So that seems to work and pan out not fully confirmed, nothing is ever fully confirmed, but it works out well. We can measure the magnetic field at the surface and in space, but it's the mantle, that's the big unknown. What is happening in Earth's mantle that is influencing magnetic field? A lot of people will look, or a lot of people will research um, into the core mantle boundary. That's obviously a very important zone, but there are thousands of kilometers here. Most of Earth's mass is in the mantle. And a lot of that magnetic field is changing, attenuating, and flowing. There's a lot of energy that's happening in the mantle below the surface that we just really are unaware of, not privy to that information yet, that data, what's happening. And so it's really with the mantle that's influencing a lot of these things that uh, we just, we're still kind of sitting back and waiting to see what will happen. And of course, we're human. We have the human time, sp uh, the time span. You know, someone that's lucky lives to 100 years. Uh, these things evolve over millions of years. So uh, we've only been looking at this for a while. Now, something that we have been seeing is a very fast movement of the magnetic pole from around Canada to uh, Russia. And some people are taking this as evidence for a magnetic pole flip. 
uh, that you can't really say that's happened until it's happened. Um, you can make a prediction, of course, um, but what seems to be uh, happening with the movement of the magnetic pole, and I have a video on this to a live stream, I'll put a link in the video description talking about this more in depth, is that there are these flux lobes. So the magnetic field strength has two lobes here in the Northern Hemisphere uh, that's higher. So here's the first one over North America, there's a second one over Russia, and over the past 20 years, the North American one has gone weaker, while the Russian one has gone stronger. So you can see that the overall magnetic field at the North Pole is very, very strong, but the magnetic, the actual like ground-based measurement of magnetic north has shifted towards Russia because this lobe is decreasing in strength and this one has been increasing in strength. Not by much, just in the nanotesla range, like uh, 500,000 nanotesla, but it's enough to move that north magnetic pole um, as measured at the ground surface. And the last actual measurement that we took for this was in 2009. So everything else is just based on models and uh, from various um, observations like ground observations, but actually going to where the North Magnetic Pole and measuring where that, that needle dips exactly perpendicular to the ground has not been done since 2000, uh, either 2000, I think it's 2007. So it's been quite a while. It's difficult to do. Um, so yeah, big, big, big changes to Earth's uh, magnetic field, uh, as you can see here, and we seem to be doing well. Uh, there hasn't been anything super crazy happening in regards to, uh, let's say, like very strong uh, geomagnetic storms over the past month or two. We had more of those during the equinoxes, but this is relevant because um, if we go back here, the 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 environment for space weather is at its least risky, you could say, during the summer months because the Earth's magnetic field does not couple well to space weather. But it's during the equinoxes, during the spring and the fall, that magnetic field uh, of our Earth couples very nicely to the interplanetary magnetic field and allows our energy to be transferred from one system to the other. So the fact that we are seeing strong energy flow um, and uh, within Earth's system, even during a period of time close to solstice when there's not that much energy connection between the Earth and the Sun, shows that this fall we can expect some pretty strong geomagnetic storms if these sunspots continue to increase in strength and in number. So here are the KP indices. We may see KP indices up to 7, 8, and 9 this fall. We may see some really big increases in the Schumann resonances. Um, but definitely we're seeing these very low frequency pulsations that just normally don't see these in the uh, Schumann resonances. And we're just seeing a bunch of them and we're seeing them repeat over time. So I uh, wanted to update you all on that and how that is uh, fundamentally a measurement of Earth's changing magnetic field. So a lot has been happening. I hope you found this video useful. I'll put some other videos in the video description that you can watch. And in general, uh, like the video. If you like the video, please subscribe. Uh, helps this channel grow. And that way you can watch the other videos that I make on space weather, on Schumann resonances, on the interactions with electromagnetism and our health. And then also how you can uh, improve your bioelectric system, how you can improve your health and wellness so these things don't affect you as much. So you stay closer to homeostasis. And so you stay happy, healthy, and live a long life. So with that, thank you so much for watching this video. Here's some more videos on screen that you can watch that I recommend you do. And with that, have a great day. Ciao.